All right, folks, JM to win is back in the saddle with me for what is shaping up to be a super fun GPP slate. We're going to talk a little bit about the water cooler conversation in DFS right now, about ownership, about leveling, about the current state of the games. And then, of course, we're going to dive in to this slate, looking at it through the lens of one of our favorite building blocks all here today on the Block Party Show. I suffer from a debilitating condition known as atropic shockitis. Peter's one of the greatest depositors I've ever seen. Trust the process. Let's go. Let's go. I got auto match with Levitan. Bullshit. If I just go the other way in that 66, I win all the money. All the money. If I had 150 lineups, I'd win too. Process over results. Hey everyone. All right, JM. No costumes this week, although we do have a different background. You are still on the run, apparently. Oh yeah, I look like I'm in uh Silence of the Lambs basement yeah. or something. <laughs> Got the cinder block wall behind me. Uh interestingly, the woman on uh, there's a woman on the airplane next to me on Wednesday who was watching Silence of the Lambs on her phone, like set up on the, I was like, well, that's a bold choice to just, you got kids around, you just got Silence yeah. of the Lambs up on your, on your chair in front of you. Good for you. But uh, yeah, that's where I'm at right now is got my, uh, my parents Silence of the Lambs backdrop. That's hilarious too. Cause sometimes, you know, you'll see on planes, like someone will watch what I'll consider like a, a comfort movie. Like I was going out to Vegas and people were watching the hangover. It's like, it makes sense. But like your comfort movie being silence of the lambs, like on a plane, that that's such a bold choice. Yeah. Just want to settle in and kind of, kind of get some Hannibal Lecter going just to get you in the mood for wherever you're going for that week. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, we are going to get you in the mood for this week six GPP slate. Uh, I know you were uh, a little off the the content grid last week with uh, with your wedding and stuff. But I will say, you know, I was talking about it on Monday. We talked about it on Lowell's yesterday. There's a lot of I don't want to say hand wringing. There's lots of concern that the chalk is is hitting at such an increased frequency and all the contrarian GPP plays are getting steamed and what is going on? Have you observed kind of this overall conversation and do you have any kind of macro thoughts on it? Yeah, so I haven't observed the conversation. It's one of the things I like. I'm, I'm such a solo like bubble. I've always called myself a bubble builder. I'm such a solo process kind of guy. And so I, I love doing this show with you. It reminds me of when I used to have my show with Levitan and, and I'd come out of my bubble on Friday and be like, oh, this is what everyone's talking about. Interesting. Let me let me hear about this. Uh, but yeah, I, I retweeted something today from Drew Dinkmeyer that, you know, somebody had, had tagged both of us in a tweet that was about the chalk hitting. And he basically broke down like, hey, you know, the chalk's hit three weeks and it's completely failed two weeks. And that's about normal, right? Like the chalk is supposed to hit sometimes. That's why it's chalk. What's interesting too, is if we look at how or why chalk is hitting, what chalk is hitting, ooh, look at Pete, Pete's on top of things. Uh, how or why chalk is hitting? Well, there's one thing if it's like sharp running back chalk or, or like a sharp even defense special teams chalk. But when you're talking about, or a guy who's like central to an offense, when you talk about something like, this wide receiver hits, right? And he ends up hitting a big plays and scoring a touchdown. The variance inherent in whether or not that guy hits for a big game, like it's the variance is so heavy that I'm never worried about a chalky wide receiver, like a Tyler Lockett hitting for the big game. And I don't have him because it's like that game can play out different ways. If we play out that slate over and over again, one of the things I talked about on the angles pod today is the Kansas city chiefs. They're literally two, three plays away from being a two and three team played exactly the same way, right? They should have lost the game to the Chargers, should have lost that game to the Raiders. They were in both those games, and that's what the NFL is all about. you got to be in all these games at the end of the game. But the perception around them, the public perception, if they were two and three, would be so different from the public perception of them at four and one. And it's always these small bounces of the ball. And so, you know, in that, in that same vein, we're a couple bounces of the ball away from chalk missing an extra week or two. And then everybody's like, boy, what's going on with the chalk? And so every chalk is different and every week is different. But when we're talking about popular wide receivers hitting or a popular defense hitting or whatever it might be, you know, th those are such high variance positions that over time, some people are going to make money, you know, playing the chalk and some people are going to make money in other ways. But when you're talking about first place finishes, 
you are going to have your clearest path to first place finishes over time, finding some way to be different. And listen, you've been in DFS long enough. You know, we have this conversation every year or every two years. This comes up all the time, typically at the beginning of the season when we have a smaller sample size. Everyone's overthinking what's happened most recently. Look, if chalk hits again this week, that's still not going to change the fact that over the last nine years, it's been most profitable to play DFS in such a way that you're giving yourself a clear path to first place that's in some ways different from what everybody else is doing. Let me give you a specific example. I remember, I, I believe it was week three. Was that the Rashad Penny week or was that week uh, week four? Week was four, the Rashad yeah. Penny week. And we had one of your building blocks. I don't believe we did it on the show, but one of your building blocks that people can get access to in the one week season subscription in the scroll was you had the Rashad Penny, TJ Hawkinson. And my guess is at the time when you wrote up that block, you knew TJ Hawkinson was going to be fairly popular. Um, but at the time, Rashad Penny was projecting to be fairly contrarian, sub 10%. Everyone had him sub 10%. I'm curious, like, how do you think about that spot? Like if I would have told you Sunday before you put that block in your lineup, Hey, ownership projections are off. Uh, Rashad Penny is going to be 30% owned in most of these contests. And you know, TJ Hawkinson is going to be 20 to 25. Does that change your line of thinking on that block? Or is this another classic? No, this is a lineups, not, you know, ownership or players thing. And I know I can build a good lineup around that. Yeah, everything's different, right? If How many people are putting those guys together? And so sometimes we have something like last week, You, if you go Brady and Evans and Godwin and you pair all three of them together, you're still at really high combinatorial ownership. That's not setting you apart. But at the same time, Scott Baird and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. There are plays that, that don't win you a tournament, but you also have to have them in order to compete in the tournament that week. And so whether it's the Devontae Adams game against Cincinnati last year or Antonio Brown against the Raiders in 2014, 15, whatever it was, or all the Christian McCaffrey games, all the Jonathan Taylor games, and these guys are super popular. And because they're super popular, that doesn't win you a tournament, but you still needed it in order to compete in the tournament that week. So you could have looked at the Rashad Penny, TJ Hawkinson one and said, okay, but do I think that this is going to put up the type of score that without it, I can't compete, right? It doesn't win you the tournament. It's no longer the piece that you're like, hey, this is my my tournament winner. We talked in in week one about back when everyone was like, why would you play Josh Jacobs? We talked about uh, Justin Herbert, Austin Eckler, Josh Jacobs in that in that Chargers and Raiders game. And the thing with that one was they were so expensive as a block and you were betting on such a specific game scenario that if it hit, you're basically in first place. You can play chalk the rest of the way because you're getting a hundred points from three players who were all low owned and were incredibly low owned together. You're the only person in the tournament with that block. And so then that's your path to first place. There's other blocks that that isn't your path to first place, but you might need it just in order to compete. And so, yeah, everything's different, right? And we, we got to judge like how likely is it that something happens versus how highly owned is it going to be? And how much are we lowering, lowering our combinatorial ownership? The, the block we're going to talk about today is on paper a worse block than some of the other ways we could play things. But what would make you the most money over time, according to current ownership projections, would be this block. And so on this one, if ownership starts changing dramatically, well, then we start changing the way that we might approach this block and say, hey, maybe this isn't our edge because on paper it's a little bit worse than some of the other spots. And so, yeah, everything's everything's unique and different. I did actually get off of TJ Hawkinson on my main build that week because of the ownership. Uh, after talking up Rashad Penny plus TJ Hawkinson and Hilo all, all day Saturday said, all you need on every roster is Reynolds, Hawkinson, and Rashad Penny is your starting point. I think he got off that on some of his builds because of the ownership. But yeah, every week's different, right? Because you still have a broad range of outcomes on, on some of these guys. And when certain guys are high owned, it doesn't matter. When other guys are high owned, it does start to matter. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I guess, do you have any thoughts in general on kind of the conversation that's being had about this idea of like GPP content specifically really driving plays and that there are a lot of people that play in the contests I play in, whether, you know, the mid stake single entry three max stuff, there are a lot of them are consuming similar content in plays that get identified as maybe sharp contrarian plays become overowned relative to that. Like you, you start to take on more risk than you want at those levels. I'm just curious if that's a dynamic that you think about. And even as a content creator, knowing like, hey, when you put out your scroll and your building blocks, like there's a lot of people who are one week season subs who are going to want to play those. I see it in the comments here. People love playing the blocks and the stuff and rightfully so. They've been identified as good plays. But I'm just curious how you think of that, that meta dynamic of a GPP play 
becoming more popular than it would have been otherwise? I don't think this is a new topic, right? I, I was asked when I was at Roto Grinders about moving GPP ownership and how I viewed that. And I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever been somebody who's really moved ownership significantly unless it's a play that's already pretty comfortable. And mm -hmm. so what I mean by that is anytime I talk about a player that I'm like, Hey, this guy is a really sharp play and he's uncomfortable to play, but here's the reasons why he's sharp. He still ends up being low owned, right? This guy might, might've been projected at 1% owned and now he comes in at 1.2% owned. Well, that's probably means no difference on my part, right? I think the, the Jonas Gray week, when I talked to Jonas Gray all week that week, he was under 1% owned that week. And that, that was at a point on Rotor Grinders where like my stuff was featured on the homepage for like three straight days late in the week. And my article where I'm talking of Jonas Gray is featured on the homepage on the site that's getting the most traffic, right? And so there's, it, if I were Levitan or Silva, I would be like, yeah, I'm probably moving ownership projections because so many content providers are reading my stuff and then using that as their research basis, right? So it's not just that Levitan and Silva say something and everybody's like, okay, now I'm going to play this guy. It's that Levitan and Silva say something and all there's so many people who are content providers in NFL DFS, but are DFS players, which means that they're playing NBA, they're playing PGA, they're playing F1, they're playing NBA, like MLB, they're playing all the sports. And yet they have to provide NFL content. And so they read Levitan and Silva. They get their thoughts there from like who the sharp plays are. And then they talk about those things. So it gets amplified, right? Yeah. But for me, nothing I'm saying is getting amplified in the space in terms of like, I know that there are a lot of Roto Grinders contributors who read one week season, but they're not taking tournament thoughts and then saying, okay, like let's amplify this. They're still trying to find kind of the sharp plays. And then they're coming up with their own tournament thoughts. And so, uh, yeah, for me, I don't think about it much just because if it's an uncomfortable play, it's still going to stay low owned, whether I'm talking about it or not. And, and I've seen that over the years because uh, I've had more or less reach at different times and it still hasn't hasn't changed uh, ownership on these uncomfortable plays. Yeah, and I do think it's an interesting dynamic, too. And I, how do you think about that? Because, you know, one of the things one week season does so well is the element of we want to teach you how to fish. We want to give you the tools and the mindset to really make good lineups. And yet people still want plays. Like people will comment on this video and be like, Hey, I had a great lineup using this block. And I'm always like, you know, the blocks are put out there for a reason, but they're again, mo more to get you thinking about ideas. Lots can change with a slate between now and then. So how do you wrestle with that of knowing like ultimately there are plays who want the hashtag best plays. And some people don't necessarily, they're not sickos like us who are willing to invest all of this time trying to untangle a slate. Well, I, I mean, it's human nature, right? I read Mike's player grid in the scroll. And if it if it echoes stuff that I've said, I'm like, okay, I feel more comfortable now with, with this. Or he'll say something, I'm like, ooh, this play, I hadn't thought about it, right? And so that's human nature. I always, the tweets that come in and it's like, shout out to one week season, got this first place finish this week. And then they post their roster and it's like, no players we talked about. Those are my yeah. favorites, right? Because then you're yeah, like- yeah, yeah. They're literally just saying, thanks for teaching me how to play DFS. And then I took my own thoughts and put together this, this roster. And then the ones that are like, shout out for these plays. And it's like, well, that's great, you know, but that's not really what DFS is truly about. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately all of us should have, our process should include thoughts from other people and we can learn things from other people, but our, our final decisions should come from ourselves because the people who also say, you know, or, or I should say on that same coin where people say, hey, thanks for these plays. The other side of that coin is where people are like, oh, thanks for wrecking my roster this week for these plays. And you're like, literally, that should never like the plays should come from you. You, you should be playing plus EV plays and we can kind of help you uncover what the plus EV plays are. Who knows what's going to happen in the small sample size of this one weekend. Right. It's easy to be like, oh, thanks for Gabe Davis last week. I talked to Gabe Davis all week last week. Gabe Davis had six targets. He had three right. catches, right? Like the variance on that is so extreme. Gabe Davis was sharp, not because he put up 171 yards and two touchdowns. He was sharp because he's capable of that type of game and was going to be super low owned coming off the ankle injury and hadn't had a big game yet this season. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, that play, that play wasn't a play play. It was a theory play. And so that type of thing, anybody can uncover that by kind of understanding what to look for. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just human nature. Like I said, 
same thing for me, man. If somebody has a play and it backs up my thinking, it makes it feel more comfortable for me, makes me feel more confident going to that play. You know, another thing I always look for is if I argue against somebody else playing a play. My nephew showed me his roster on Saturday and it had Jacoby Myers on it. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and then and then by that night I had to be like, hmm, why am I doing that? You know, and by Sunday morning, yeah. Jacoby Myers is on my main build because the first instinct is to be like, nah, not Jacoby Myers, right? And and yeah. he's coming off the injury and Bailey Zappi's his quarterback. And then you're like, yeah, who else is Bailey Zappi gonna throw to? He's still gonna throw the ball 20 to 25 times. The targets are gonna go to his best receiver. And the upside's there against the Lions. And so it's like, yeah, it's just an interesting dynamic of you got to find those those buttons that make you end up on the right place. And sometimes those buttons are arguing against plays. Sometimes those buttons are, hey, this other guy likes it. I feel a little bit more comfortable with it. Yeah, that was, a, that was one of the points that Dink made last week about chasing the fear. Like when we have that, uh, you just reject a play immediately. It's because it makes us uncomfortable. I remember last week I said to myself, I was like, the, the comfy GPP play to me feels like James Robinson. This is a great matchup. I was like, ETN looks really good to me. And it feels gross. I worry about his touch count and stuff. And I was like, that's how I know it's a good play because it feels uncomfortable and kind of chasing that um, if you have your, your instincts dialed in. And the other thing I would say too is, you know, when you're consuming content or even people you respect is like, everyone has different play styles, right? Like I can look at a JM lineup and I'm like, that's a JM to win lineup. I can look at a Leone lineup and I say, that's a Leone Thunderdome lineup. I can look at say the mock Lovin or the a Raven type lineups that are at the top of the leaderboard on, on chalky weeks. I say, I can identify that And it all depends on your skill set, it too, in the type of contest you're playing. And I think that's where sometimes you could get in trouble as if like, Oh, I'm pulling all this from all these directions and I'm not, actually playing to my strengths or how I like to play and optimizing for those specific contests. So that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately too. Yeah. I mean, finding your own style of play is a big part of it too. It's, it's, it's going to be different. It's like a musician, right? Their fourth album is going to sound different from their first album, but it's still going to be identifiable as that artist. And um, you know, when I did my Levitan show, there were every maybe two, three times a season, I would text him shortly after kickoff and, and like guess that this was his chalk, uh, his yeah. cash game roster. And I sometimes would get it right down to all nine players, right? Because you just kind of get a sense of how different people see things and how they think. And ideally you should be able to do that with your own builds to where you get to a point where you're like, okay, this is a me type of roster. And the beauty of that is it's like this wheel spins and it's not always going to land on your type of roster every week. But if you know what your type of roster is, then you're not always chasing what that I think. I think Matthew Berry was the one who first used the term whack-a-mole. And you're not playing that whack-a-mole game of like this worked last week, this worked last week. And, and he obviously talked about that in terms of individual players in, in season long, but even in terms of play styles. And if you know where you stand on that wheel, then when the wheel spins to your spot, you're going to be there. And, and that's really what you want to be doing is you need just one GPP hit every few seasons and you're sitting pretty. And so if, if you're always kind of in that spot on the wheel where, you know, when this, when my week hits, I'm going to be there, then you're in great shape. Yeah. That's such a good point about that too. Right. Cause if you're chasing the style of lineup that one, Oh, the chalk lineup hit, Oh, the super contrarian lineup hit. Oh, the one that overstacked the single game hit. And then you're going to be one week behind as opposed to sticking to your process, knowing, Hey, as you always say in that phrase, if we play this slate a hundred times, a thousand times, how many times do I win? And that week will come along at some point for you. And if you're chasing the moving target, it seems so much less likely that you are going to land on that week that you you're, you're, you know, hunting for. Yeah. And, and it takes time too. It takes time, but if you're intentional about it and you're kind of uh, assessing your style of playing your process week in and week out, you'll get there. You know, one thing you could do this year is just decide that you're a, a Kenny Pickett, George Pickens, Deontay Johnson style of player. And you could literally, that's a stack. I truly believe that stack will finish in first place in the Millie maker one week this season. You could yeah. just play that stack every week, regardless of matchup and just be like, whenever it hits, I'm going to be there. You know, like there's ways to do that. I talked about that with the Astros the year that it turned out they were cheating, but regardless of what pitcher they were facing, you could stack the Astros every day and you were going to win money over time because they were going to hit often enough. Uh, that it would be plus EV. And so, yeah, finding your style of play, finding what you're going to stick to is, uh, I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's such a big thing because for most people, it's like, we're too, most people, you need that level of confidence. You know what uh, Von Miller said this week, what separates uh, good teams from other good teams is mindset. And it's really true, right? Like the more confidence you have 
in yourself and your ability to pull the trigger on these decisions. How often do DFS players come back on Sunday night? They're like, God, I was on this player and I just didn't trust myself enough to pull the trigger. And so if you just give yourself a couple of weeks, uh, I've even had times where I take, I suppose it was easier in MLB DFS because the slates come day after day, but give yourself a couple of days off, but still assess the slate as if you're going to play it. And what you start seeing is, okay, if I, like, if I played this slate and actually pulled the trigger on the guys I trusted, well, I probably would have done really well. And so it's just harder when you're week in and week out, you kind of get that fear and you pull back from that fear instead of leaning into that fear. And so, uh, yeah, it's finding, finding what is your style of play and finding a way to kind of embrace that fear and get onto these, um, these guys that can win you a tournament. Yeah. In your own style of play, like I said, it takes time, but over time that that can really settle in and you can know what your approach is each week. Are there any trends now through five weeks? I know that was something you mentioned at the beginning of the year, that there'll be some of these teams or players that the field is just reluctant to buy into. They don't buy it. And you can kind of get ahead of that and hammer that for a few weeks until the field kind of catches up and it you know, reaches a, an efficiency kind of tipping point. Are there any spots like that right now? Or do you think uh, things are, are fairly efficient in how the market is perceiving certain teams and players? We were there for what a couple of weeks on Seattle where people weren't trusting it. I think we were there early in the season on the Lions where people weren't trusting it. I'm trying to think if there's anybody who really let's here's one. Um, Amari Cooper, right? He's got double digit, I think it's 11 plus targets in three of his last four games. People still don't want to play him. He's only 5,900. Uh, it's not like Jacoby Brissett's throwing 40 plus passes, right? It's not one of these games where we're like, oh, he's getting so many targets, but the the volume is really high and that's the reason why it's like he's percent's throwing 28 29 34 passes amara keeps getting these targets david njoku keeps getting these targets uh george pickens is going to be priced at 6200 6500 before the season's over um but yeah nothing nothing major Brees hall we talked about Brees hall going back to week three it was like well his role is trending up but people have started to catch on to that right week three it was like hey start pulling pulling the trigger on Brees hall because he's going to be the lead back here. I think that Travis Etienne is the same way in Jacksonville. He's a guy who you could start pulling the trigger on and just seeing that he's underpriced compared to where he's going to be deeper into the season. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that the field on a, on a lot of these, they've adjusted quickly, but there's started, it's for me, it's typically, I'd say around like week seven to week 10 is where we really start to get to that range where people aren't adjusting their thinking as quickly, right? They think, okay, this is what this season is offering us. And then they stick with that. But teams are always evolving all season long. A team in week seven is different from a team in week 10 is different from a team in week 12 or 13. And so once the field starts really saying, okay, now we know everything for this year. I think that's where we really start finding our, our edges. I will, here's one for you, the Arizona defense, um, mm. giving up 23 or fewer points in, in four straight games. Um, they allowed two catches to Devontae Adams, four catches to Cooper Cup, three catches to A.J. Green. They fit, or A.J. Green, A.J. Brown. They were, uh, they were, Arizona probably has allowed three catches to A.J. Green this year as well. <laughs> they, uh, they were 13th best last year, which is middle of the pack, but 13th best last year in wide receiver yards allowed. I think they're top five right now this year, but they're not just like a, a defense that's like, oh, they're the worst defense in the, in the league, go out of your way to attack them. But that's the perception because week one, Kansas City had no trouble with them. And then everyone kind of has that week one perception that they carry over. And so Arizona, by no means a good defense, but also by no means the worst defense in the NFL. I think that's a spot where people are kind of, they, their thoughts got planted into concrete at the start of the season. They haven't adjusted, but we're still in sort of that field is willing to adjust type of phase and we're going to start coming out of that over the next few weeks where the field is like, okay, now we know everything. And, and that, that fatigue starts to set in of trying to constantly readjust the way that you're seeing these teams, which is where we can really gain our edges in terms of what the coaches are saying, what the teams are saying. Uh, John Harbaugh this last week said J.K. Dobbins had his best game as a pro this last week. But what the field sees is, oh, J.K. Dobbins' touches were down. He's still not kind of ascending yet. And so – the Ravens must not really like him. He's not going to be anything this season, but we still have a chance. Like there could be some JK Dobbins weeks this season. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next few weeks when we'll start to get a sense of what some of these are. 
Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned Seattle and the field kind of coming around them, and it's it's not even hard to come around them when you have Geno Smith at 5,700, Tyler Lockett at 5,600, Kenneth Walker at 5,400. It's like, at least with Amon Ross St. Brown in Detroit, they started pricing them up aggressively, and you had a little bit of pause with these guys. Oh, Jamal Williams over 6K now. But but with these guys, it's like they, they project as such good points per dollar plays. Um, it is a little frustrating that they're not at more interesting price points. Yeah, DraftKings is usually really good with with their pricing, and usually they take ownership into account uh, in their pricing algorithm. And so the Tyler Lockett one is especially weird. I think his price went down by like a hundred bucks this week, yeah. didn't it? Uh, yeah. And and yeah, I mean against an Arizona defense that the field's perception is that they're awful, and Seattle's playing at home this week. That that was a really strange one, and there were, there was a lot of pricing stuff this week that you're kind of like, well, come on, DraftKings, where are you at, right? <laughs> Did you guys take the week off last week? Uh, but yeah, that's certainly frustrating when that happens because it's kind of like Coors Field games in, in MLB where you're like, well, what do you do? Like, do you just play the chalk or they make it a more binary decision point? But with wide receivers, again, though, the variance is so much higher at the wide receiver position than it looks on the surface after looking at four or five weeks of game logs, right? I mean, what yeah. if Justin Jefferson, he had a couple games of single digit points this year. Um, we all think that Jamar Chase can't put up 40 point games now because he's had this slow start to the season. Like uh, variance of wide receiver position is, is there's going to be Tyler Lockett weeks where he puts up four points, five points, six points. And uh, everybody's going to be surprised when it happens, but that's, that's the nature of the position. Yeah. And we did uh, the slate is getting even more interesting by the minute. Uh, Adam Schefter just reporting that Cam Akers will be ruled out and will not be playing on Sunday. So Darrell Henderson enters the conversation as another one of these uh, nice punt play running backs. He's priced at 5,100. So uh, I will say right now, I mean, this is, this is going to be a pay down week at running back. I mean, if you want to include Ramondre at 6k, but then having Walker, Eno Benjamin, Henderson, it does seem like uh, a chalk build, at least. Sure, there's some pieces that could be arranged, but feels like the field will largely be building in a very similar way. Right, and running back volume can be so bankable. It's interesting to look at these spots like Kenneth Walker, right? Pete Carroll this week was like, oh, I love DJ Dallas. We're excited to get him involved. And uh, he hasn't really shown that with his actions in the past, but Kenneth Walker is probably not going to come out and dominate snaps, right? So some of the, like, not all these plays are built the same. Arizona always kind of shifts things up in the backfield on us. I don't know that they're going to throw Keontae Ingram into the fire and, and let him get more, more touches than we would expect. Maybe, Eno you know, Benjamin really is a workhorse, but we, we talked about this, the Jamal Williams week. The perception tends to be this backup steps in and he gets all the touches. Jamal Williams played 48% of the snaps in the week he smashed, smashed at chalk. And it took him getting his longest run of his career and two touchdowns just to pay off his salary, right? But then you've got a guy like Ramondre Stevenson. Pierre Strong was active last week. Pierre Strong is active the last four weeks. No offensive snaps so far. Damian Harris goes down after six snaps. Pierre Strong never sees the field on offense. Ramondre Stevenson plays 54 out of 54 snaps the rest of the way. On a team that wants to run the ball this week, they're playing the number 32 run defense by DVOA in Cleveland. So not all of these kind of guys stepping into the lead role are built equally, right? Like yeah. we, we know that Ramondre is probably playing every snap and probably getting 25 plus touches. These other guys, a lot of times we're projecting that that's what's going to happen. And not to say it won't, but just to say that, you know, there's certainly viability to saying, okay, Nick Chubb is 3% owned. Well, Nick Chubb can put up 35 points and maybe all these cheap running backs stay under 20 points and that ends up being an edge. So uh, yeah. And, and then, you know, we might just say, Hey, double pay down at running back on your main build and do something different elsewhere. There's certainly other places where we can do things differently this week. Yeah. And I should also mention as we start to head into talking through some of the building blocks and the specific uh, slate dynamics for week six, uh, we do have a special promo going on one week season. So of course we do have the usual 20% uh, off with a uh, promo code Pete for stuff like uh, one week season for life and checking out the weekly pass. But JM has hooked us up with a 40% off this week. If you guys want to get the OWS DFS or OWS inner circle, 40% off with, it's a slightly different code, Pete 40, just tack on the 40. And what, for people who um, aren't familiar, what's the difference between OWS DFS and inner circle? So OWS DFS is our, our like kind of foundational DFS subscription. Inner circle has everything that comes with 
OWSDFS, which is most of our content, all of the NFL Edge stuff, ownership projections, uh, projections. Inner Circle, we have a Tuesday podcast with me that talks like macro DFS theory and strategy, a Saturday podcast with Zandamir and Hilo that talks about the strategy for that week's slate. So instead of just talking about picks and players, we break down the strategy for that week's slate. We also in ownership projections, we have what we call cheat sheet ownership projections, where instead of just projections with the number projected owned, we also have strategy notes to the side of individual players. So kind of break down like what the ownership projections actually mean and how we can apply that to our rosters. Uh, we have afternoon only content for inner circle. We have uh, Mike Johnson has his Sunday crunch, which is his late Sunday morning thoughts as part of inner circle. So it's just a small amount extra in money and, and basically a, a lot of extra perks. So I think that this year we've had like 90% of people who have come into the site have, have picked up inner circle instead of OWSDFS, just because it's, it's the same things you get with OWSDFS and then a lot of additional things for not a lot of additional money. But yeah, we, we, you know, we're basically a quarter of the way through the season. So we took 25% off and then tacked on some extra uh, for you guys. So it's 40% off if you use Pete 40. Um, and that's going to keep going next week, the next week. So uh, if you come in on a, on a rest of season pass, you can keep using that over the next few weeks. There you go. So like I said, if you're, uh, if you just want to dabble, I recommend using promo code Pete to check out that weekly pass, see, uh, poke around. And then if you're willing to, uh, to dive in, then definitely take advantage of Pete 40 for that 40% off. Uh, obviously I'm biased, but, uh, a steal reading through the scroll each week. And I can just show you guys quickly here a little bit. Obviously the content doesn't populate, uh, until later in the week, but you get all of this stuff, JM's player grid, Mike's player grid, MME pool, all kinds of good thoughts and ruminations oh, on the site. I didn't even mention the uh, the Oracle as part of Inner Circle as well. It's probably one of the coolest things, but we have like five strategy questions that Mike and Zandamir and Hilo and I all answer on Saturdays uh, as part of the Oracle, which is Inner Circle only as well. So there you go. Hop on over there. If you guys have questions about it, feel free to hit up me. Hit, feel free to hit up JM to win plenty of testimonials over there for people who are have been happy with diving in. But let's dive in to this slate. Uh, be earlier this morning, and of course, this doesn't include the, the Henderson you know, updated projection, which will surely be coming in. But I was running what looked like the, you know, the quote unquote uh, chalk lineup, the ceiling optimal, and it seemed... So obvious uh, how this build was at least currently shaking out. And I will also say when I was looking at, you know, projected ownership and even this product ownership in the final column, this was one of the biggest ownership projections I had seen all year when I do this exercise of looking at the quote unquote best lineup. So first of all, are you getting the feel for a very specific build kind of shaping up this week, at least for what the best plays are? Oh, hundred percent. Right. We're going to have people aren't going to be paying up at they, they want to get Mark Andrews or Travis Kelsey's coming in at lower ownership, but that's going to probably go up a little bit throughout the weekend. They want to get to Josh Allen. People don't like pairing Josh Allen with a pass catcher. Don't ask me why Josh Allen, if he gets you 30 points. Yeah, that's a great score. And he's probably not bringing one of his pass catchers with him. If he gets you 40 points, which is the score you need, like where you're like, Oh, I needed this guy to win a tournament. Well, he's bringing some pass catchers with him. Look at last week. You know, obviously that that kind of uh, super dubbed cash game lineup last week had Josh Allen and no pass catchers. Yeah. But also, if you'd gone Josh Allen, Gabe Davis, Khalil Shakir, Stefan Diggs, you're smashing in tournaments. And so if Josh Allen has his ceiling game, which is what you're actually wanting if you roster him, and uh, we'll get to actually some of that here in a moment of what we really mean by that. But if you're – if you're putting a guy in your roster, you're technically saying this guy has his ceiling game. If he has a ceiling game, he's probably bringing somebody with him. But yeah, in cash games, this is a tremendous roster. In tournaments, I think we can beat this roster, and there are a number of ways that we can do that, right? And part of it is playing off of the fact that we know that a lot of rosters are going to look like this. This is ownership projections across the board are looking like this. People are going to feel great because same thing with last week, Lockett and Alave were both coming in on on uh, you know highest projections, and so it looked great. But then you're also like, ooh, these guys are in the same game. I get yeah. some correlation, and we're gonna have that with Rondell and Tyler Lockett this week. Uh, we got Eno Benjamin, we got Kenneth Walker, we got the running backs in that game, which kind of makes this a more fragile roster, right? If that game disappoints, then you've got multiple players disappointing across the board. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this roster is let's say like this: this roster is certainly sharp in terms of just maximizing points, right? And there's a chance that this roster hits. There's also a chance that Rondell Moore, who, you know, has like what three games in his career north of 29 right. yards or something like yeah. that. Like there's a chance that Rondell Moore disappoints. Tyler Lockett, who 
you know, we've seen throughout his career these huge fluctuations in his scoring. But Tyler Lockett chalk is not necessarily always the sharpest way to go. There's a chance that the that Kenneth Walker ends up, you know, not having the role that everybody expects. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things to play around with this week. And this build, as far as salary allocation, makes a lot of sense. And if people make some changes, they're going to say, okay, how do I get up to Stefan Diggs? Or how do I, you know, get up to Saquon Barkley? How do I do things a little bit differently? But there's certainly some ways that we go very different this week. And, um, and yeah, create a clear path to a first place finish. Yeah. And what's interesting to me about this lineup is it, it does feel like everything's coming to a head where we have a lot of narratives. The chalk always smashes. This is a fun chalk lineup. You know, sometimes there's weeks where it's David Montgomery and Leonard Fournette and everyone's like, yeah, not my sexiest players, but guys like Eno and Kenneth Walker and Rondell Moore and Ramondre. Like these are some of the sexiest players. Again, if we have a little trickle over effect from best ball season, like these were guys that people loved and were excited to draft. So I do think we could see everything come to a head in a big way of being like, not only are people more and more willing to eat the chalk based on some recency bias things, but they get to do it with the stamp of approval of fun players. So I could see a variation of this lineup just being incredibly popular this week. Yeah. And it's almost like, you know, I always talk about Cubs fan would say rosters that finish all the way to the left or all the way to the right in the standings. And there's this clumped up group in the middle. And it's like, if you don't jump over that clumped up group, you get bounced all the way to the back of the standings. But if you, can jump over that clumped up group, you can move all the way to the right of the standings. And this is that clumped up group, right? And yeah. we can look at this on Friday and it's like, yeah, but I can't even see how these plays could fail. Yeah. But that was the same thing everyone was saying when the Dolphins were coming off their monster game against the Ravens and playing a Bill secondary that was missing every starter. And it was like, I can't see how Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle can fail. And then Buffalo's like, cool, we'll we'll play shell coverage and force you guys to work underneath and like still get our pass rush. And and you know, those guys both completely bombed. Ramondre Stevenson is incredibly good chalk. But also, would it shock you if he catches three passes for 25 yards and rushes for 75 yards and doesn't score a touchdown? He ends up with about 12, 13 points. And and you know, he's 50% owned in contest, right? These things can happen. And so it's very easy. Chris Godwin, he doesn't have that many games with Brady north of 20 fantasy points. He really doesn't. He hasn't scored many touchdowns with Brady, but he has a handful of like spiked weeks where his average games look really good when you just look at like average fantasy points per game. But it's certainly possible that Chris Godwin comes out in, in this kind of slot shorter area role and has 15 points. It's certainly possible that Tyler Lockett comes out against an Arizona defense that has dominated wide receivers this year and funneled targets to tight ends. And Noah Fant and Will Disley end up catching nine passes and scoring two touchdowns and Metcalf and Lockett do nothing. Like it's perfectly possible that Rondell Moore catches six passes for 19 yards as he always does. And so, yeah, like this chalk build, it looks sharp. And like you said, everything's coming to a head. Recency bias. We're like, well, I don't even see how this roster can fail. I have to play this. And would it really surprise us on Sunday night if seven of those nine players disappointed? It really wouldn't. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like this week a lot. I'm going to play my style of play still. I'm going to try to say, hey, if all if this, if this clump of stuff even finishes way over here close to the right, I still want to find a way to jump over it. But I also know that it could finish way over here and ownership is going to be really concentrated on it. There could be a lot of running room on this side of that clumped up stuff. And, and I can get my path to first place from there. Well, let's dive in here. As we always like to do, we want to build around one of the building blocks and you end up putting uh, multiple of these up within the scroll, but you are nice enough to give us a sneak peek at one of them here on the show. So I'm going to get this DraftKings lineup pulled up. And uh, before you kind of tell us what we're going to be working with, I will mention, as usual, we got the Rake Free Deposit Kingdom Weekly League. I had them bump it up to 425 this week. 425, look at that. Look at us. I should have done 420, you know, for the brand. Uh, we are at 425. This link's available exclusively in the Discord. If you go into the announcements section, you can find this. They're at the top. Hop in. You can have your lineup reviewed in all of its glory on Monday morning. If you want to play a cash game lineup in this contest, I assure you it will come in very low owned as we are a group of galaxy brainers in the Deposit Kingdom Weekly League. But JM, let me know where are we going? Where are we starting? What's the block here? Okay, so we talked before the show. We wanted to do something, again, like I said earlier, it's a little bit less strong on paper, 
but from a standpoint of what gets us to first place, it's super sharp. So uh, this block is going to be Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and Devin Duvernay. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple interesting things to talk about here. How does Devin Duvernay fit onto this block? So when I said, you know, we want to create our clearest path to first place, and that doesn't mean predicting what's going to happen in all the games. What that often means is recognizing what becomes our clearest path to first place. So in other words, our clearest path to first place, once we put Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey on here, is not just them having a good game. If they have a good game, but Mark Andrews also smashes, we're still competing against those high-owned Mark Andrews rosters. So what we want to say is, in order for, we, we let's say we put Mahomes and Kelsey on here. Well, why are we putting Mahomes and Kelsey on here? Mahomes is currently projected just over 2% ownership. Kelsey's projected under 5% ownership. Those numbers will probably come up a bit as we get closer to the weekend because there are enough GPP players who know what they're doing that they're going to say, really, this ownership's too low. This becomes sharp. But it's going to be lower owned than it should be. Well, that's fine, right? Buffalo's defense is good, but also Patrick Mahomes can be matchup proof. So if this pairing ends up hitting... What we also want in order to clear out our path to first place is for Mark Andrews to disappoint. Do we think that the Ravens offense will disappoint? No. So we can say, well, let's put Duvernay on there and hope that he ends up getting a two touchdown game. We know Andrews is still going to have a solid game, but it can be one of those eight catches for 70 yards, no touchdowns types of games. And now we've got Duvernay who could end up getting the touchdowns, could end up getting, this is assuming Rashad Bateman's out this week, but uh, who could end up getting six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight targets, and maybe a couple carries from there also has that return upside. And so what we get is a, a spot where we're not just getting Kelsey plus Mahomes, but we're also clearing out our path to first place. Another thing I want to bring up here, well, actually I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the last seven times that Kelsey has hit, which is like 24 plus points, going back to the start of last season. So the last seven times he's hit, going back to the start of 2021, every single one of those games, Patrick Mahomes has also hit many of those Mahomes has gone for like 33, 35, 37 points. So in other words, a lot of people play Kelsey and don't play Mahomes. If you're getting your Kelsey bet correct, you're almost certainly getting your Patrick Mahomes bet correct. And so you're leaving money on the table by playing Kelsey and not playing Mahomes. So what I mean by that is you might play Kelsey and he disappoints. And then it's like, yeah, but now Kelsey disappointed and Mahomes disappoints. Well, who cares? If Kelsey disappoints, you're not winning a tournament with the salary you're spending on him. But if you get your Kelsey bet correct, you are getting the Patrick Mahomes bet correct as well. So why go somewhere else at quarterback? And most people don't recognize that. And there's, you see so often Kelsey without Mahomes, but if Kelsey hits his tournament winning game, Mahomes is also the guy that you want at quarterback. Now, could Josh Allen still outscore Mahomes to where, Kelsey plus Josh Allen end up being a little bit better. Yes, but mathematically, you're giving yourself way more things to get right when you know that Kelsey plus Mahomes is almost always going to work in tandem. So Kelsey plus Mahomes becomes really sharp. It's lower owned than it should be because both players are lower owned individually than they should be. And most people don't pair them as at as high of a level as they should. And then Duvernay plays off of that to kind of say, if Mark Andrews isn't getting the points, you know, now I get those points that also clear out my path to first place. So I really like this starting point this week. Again, not like the sharpest way to start your roster on paper because Josh Allen is a better play on paper than Patrick Mahomes is. But if we played out this slate a hundred times, you don't think Patrick Mahomes would smash more often than 2.2% of the time. Right. So uh, yeah, I really like this starting point. Pete curious for your thoughts on this. Yeah, I like it. The one element that I'm trying to think through a little bit is knowing that people are going to prefer to play Josh Allen. And I, I know you mentioned how people aren't necessarily going out of their way to stack him. I do think with the value here that the most likely thing will be a Patrick Mahone or sorry, a Josh Allen with Stefan Diggs. And most people, they want to target this game. They know it has the highest projected total on the slate. There's also people are really burnt and disappointed by these wide receivers. I believe it was MVS is the only one who's had a top 24 finish um, this entire year. So to me, it would seem if I were building that stack, I'd go Allen Diggs, bring it back with Kelsey because I want access. Kelsey has been the main driver. So I'm curious, how are you kind of thinking about that of Kelsey maybe being the de facto bring back for Josh Allen stacks? Well, exactly. And, and that's the way people are going to look at it. And then my thinking is, 
but why play Josh Allen if you're just giving yourself an extra thing you have to get right? You know, mm-hmm. so like the moment Kelsey, so the way I'm I'm going to play this game is either Mahomes plus Kelsey or Josh Allen with a partner and no bring back because mm-hmm. then you're basically saying, okay, like last year, the Bills in the regular season won this game 38 to 20. We know that the the Chiefs are willing to spread the ball around. We know they have not had a wide receiver top 90 yards this year. We know that they have not had a wide receiver score a touchdown. And we know that for five years, you could just have had a rule. I've had this rule. Never play a wide receiver against Buffalo. And you never come out of the weekend disappointed that you have that rule. So I'm perfectly fine saying, hey, Bills smash, right? And nobody on Kansas City ends up putting up the type of score you need. And then you end up with, instead of Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs and the Kelsey bring back, you can go over to Mark Andrews and say, well, I'm essentially betting that Kelsey – by not having Mahomes on this roster, I'm, a, I'm betting that Kelsey disappoints. And so you can have Mark Andrews to account for that. And so for me, I'm going to have that in the building blocks as well. I'll give that away right here. But Josh Allen, Isaiah McKenzie, and Mark Andrews is another way to account for this game that I kind of like. But the the thinking is, right, the, the very fact that everybody will say, yeah, but Kelsey's the only clear bring back on the Josh Allen roster means that we can say, yes, but if Kelsey hits, that means Mahomes is hitting. So why even take on that extra guesswork? Mahomes can get you 35, 37 points. Uh, again, I wish I had the numbers right in front of me, and I don't want to uh, spend time pulling up a bunch of screens on here but um, on my end. But, but yeah, it's like the scores that Mahomes gets when Kelsey hits, they're not like 26-point scores. There was a game where Kelsey put up 24.7 and Mahomes put up 26 points or something like that. The rest of them have all been 30-plus points. You look at Josh Allen's game logs this year, he has four games of about 30 points and then one smash, right? Mahomes, if 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 Kelsey's putting up his 26, 27, 29 point game, Mahomes is probably outscoring Josh Allen in that spot. And even if he's not, right, you just these two bets work together. It's a it's a compact bet. You're betting on one thing, you get both things right. So then I feel like the next question I would ask you with this lineup um is for Mahomes and Kelsey to kind of reach their, their ceiling potential. Is there a bill, maybe something in the running game that is interesting to you? And then same with kind of the Duvernay stuff. Um, If you're rooting, not rooting, but if you're, you're playing it as Mark Andrews fails and Duvernay captures it, are you playing for a bit of giants action as well? How are you thinking about the, the opposition for these teams? So let's break that down, I guess, into two parts. One, how am I thinking about it? And then two, what do I want What do I want to do on this roster, right? So I'll take Duvernay first. Duvernay at 4,700. This is such a concentrated offense that we don't need a piece from the Giants doing anything for Duvernay to put up a 25-point game. We just need Duvernay to get hit. You know, uh, Lamar Jackson hasn't, I think it's 32 pass attempts. He hasn't topped 32 pass attempts in a game this year. And yet, Mark Andrews is getting... 10 targets, 10 targets, 10 targets, right? It's just a very concentrated offense. Duvernay had seven targets. I think it was seven targets and three carries last week. So Duvernay doesn't need a bring back. At the same time, would it hurt? No. Is salary going to start getting tight based on what we've started our roster with here? Yes. Is Wandell Robinson likely to play this week at 3,600? Yes. Is he currently projected for under 1% owned? Yes. So Wandell Robinson becomes a very interesting play on this roster. He's not necessary with Duvernay. On the flip side, in order for Mahomes and Kelsey to hit their ceiling game, do the Bills have to be putting up points? Almost certainly. And so there's a couple sides here, right? The Bills spread the ball around. So at their price tag, at, at Diggs' price tag, it's not it's not inconceivable that he could have a really strong real-life game, even go over 100 yards, and just not get the touchdowns. And he's not worth playing. And so the bigger question is, where do the touchdowns come from? And that could be Gabe Davis could hit some big plays, but also Isaiah McKenzie could score the touchdowns. If Dawson Knox comes back this week, he had, what, nine touchdowns last year. None so far this year, and everybody's just going to write him off. Uh, so he could end up being the guy who scores the touchdowns. If he misses, Quentin Morris could be the guy who scores the touchdowns. Uh, I guess we don't want the tight end and the flex on this type of roster, but something like Isaiah McKenzie on this roster, Gabe Davis on this roster, becomes really interesting. That You don't have to pay all the way up for digs, and you get lower ownership on these other guys. So I would like to get a Bills player on this roster. Uh, because they spread the ball around, I don't think it's 100% necessary. But Isaiah McKenzie, Gabe Davis, I'm fine with either of them going on here. Uh, and then also Wondell Robinson is is a guy who I'd be very interested in on this roster as well. Yeah, uh, I agree. Let's put um, let's put McKenzie in just because that extra salary off of Gabe Davis will give us a little more flexibility to play with. And if we end up 
finding some extra spare chains and want to upgrade, uh, I think we can. But let's uh, let's roll with McKenzie here. And like you said, we can hold off on the Wandel if uh, we want to go that route. But uh, I'm really curious to see how you're approaching running back, knowing we have so much value down there. Curious if you if you want to eat some of that chalk, if we're going to pay up. How are you thinking about that? Yeah, and, and real quickly on McKenzie, one thing too is if we think like a coach, what is Kansas City going to do this week? They're probably going to try to take – they know that their defense is the one weak link in this game from Kansas City offense, Kansas City defense, Buffalo offense, Buffalo defense. They're going to try to take away that deep passing, which could open things up underneath for Isaiah McKenzie. Uh, at running back, like I said, Ramondre Stevenson is extremely sharp chalk, and I'm totally fine – not overthinking it. We always want to think about what else is on our roster. Well, this Mahomes, if Mahomes ownership is staying under 5%, if Kelsey staying under 7%, 8%, we know that we have, uh, you know, and, and everybody's on Andrews, people aren't on Duvernay. We've already pushed enough buttons here. Isaiah McKenzie's coming in with low ownership. We can comfortably put Ramondre Stevenson on this roster if we like him, if we're convicted on him as a play. I'm, I'm assuming you're convicted on him as a play. Uh, I'm totally fine putting him on here, but I'll let you make that call on Ramondre, or if we want to just go different in other spots uh, at this running back position. The only thing that was giving me a bit of pause about Ramondre was Damian Harris was at practice yesterday. Um, yeah, but so Mac Jones has been at practice for yeah. Mac Jones has been limited for three weeks. Like that's just yeah. Uh, if, like if we look, if Damian Harris plays, then we don't want Ramondre. At, right at high ownership. But yeah, I mean, I think that to me, that is um, Bill Belichick playing his typical injury report games. Yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and, and put him in here. And I do think, I think there's a chance just the combination of um, all of this cheap running back value now with Eno Walker and Henderson coupled with Damian Harris at practice that maybe he doesn't reach the early ownership projections where right now, a, aggregated across some sites. I had it at 40%, which is one of the highest marks I've seen yet. I think it might have a chance to come down uh, based on some of these slate dynamics. Yeah. It's what's so what's interesting to me about running back this week is my running back list is large. There's so many guys on it and they're all relatively sharp. Right. And so I think that people could start seeing, like you said, they're like, Oh, well, there's other sharp ways to play the running back position. And, and we could see lowered ownership on, on Ramondre here. Uh, because of that. What I would want to do at this point is not commit to my next running back yet because I'd want to get a sense of, you know, because it would be great to get up to Nick Chubb or mm -hmm. get up to, you know, Saquon's going to have some ownership, but Saquon, one of these higher priced guys who's going to go lower owned and just change our salary allocation, do something a little bit different. People won't, won't have Chubb on a Ramondre roster, but really both guys can hit in the same game because they're both central to their offense. This is going to be a a ground-based game for both teams. Um, and so I'd want to wait and see, like, because I don't I also wouldn't mind playing Eno Benjamin on this roster. I wouldn't mind playing uh I'd probably go Eno Benjamin over Kenneth Walker because Kenneth Walker is going to come out of that game with one or two receptions, whereas Eno could have five, six catches at 4,600. But uh, I wouldn't mind playing one of these other chalky running backs at the lower price range, but I'd want to kind of see what else we have. So defense, let's talk about defense real quickly. Uh defense. Panthers are going to be popular, totally fine yep. to play saints. For some reason, everybody wants to attack Joe Burrow, totally fine to play, uh, but a defense that's really interesting to me this week. So I like all the expensive defenses, right? The Rams, yeah. the Packers, the Bucks, the 49ers, the Ravens, all of those are on my list. But one defense that is interesting to me this week is the dolphins, the dolphins mm. who have negative one, negative four and plus two points on the road but 18 points at home against New England, nine points at home against Buffalo. Weather on Sunday is 85 degrees, 65% humidity. And if you've been practicing in Minnesota, it's just really tough to acclimate your body to that. And we've mm -hmm. seen it for years. Playing the Dolphins defense in September at home is such an edge. And as we get into October, the weather starts to cool a little bit in Florida, humidity goes away, less of an edge. But on these weekends when the weather is like this, they have that shot to be a really nice defense. And so, again, not the best on paper play, but going to be really low ownership on the upside is there. You know, worst case, they get you three, four points, which is most defenses, but they can actually get you double digit points at, at low ownership. So that kind of gives us some salary understanding of, of where we're at. And then uh, I'll let you make the call on, on whether we want to go Wandell Robinson and then see what we have left with salary or whether we want to instead kind of go some different directions. There are certainly some interesting places we can go. George Pickens is a guy. 
I really yeah. like this week. You could go like a Pickens, Mike Evans pairing uh, this week um, is another thing we could do and then see what we have left to salary for running back. Yeah, I was going to say, like, obviously, the way this lineup shaping up, we probably have salary for one more spend up, um, either at running back or wide receiver. And I think either of those are going to be unique um, because I think the way things are shaking out, sure, people are going to play digs. But for the most part, people are going to be paying up at quarterback. They're going to be paying up at tight end. And I think it's going to be hard for people to access, obviously, Cooper Cup at 9,700. I think Justin Jefferson will be a little sneaky at 8,900, although maybe not the play here. If we're using the Dolphins, I kind of like Jamar Chase, and you mentioned Mike Evans. So I'm kind of intrigued with getting in one of these higher-priced wide receivers that aren't going to be used much. Yeah, I think we're going to have a, we're going to have a really interesting salary place. I think we'll have... 4.2 K left over at running back, which isn't quite enough. We could let's throw in Pickens and Evans, see what that gives us. And then we could probably pivot down to the Panthers defense and go, Eno you know, Benjamin is I think exactly how that salary is going to end up working out. Yeah. So if we go Pickens and Evans, yeah, you're right at 42. So if we were, to be- so we can go down what, or the Panthers are, um, 2,400, 24. We're off by a, by a hundred there to make that yep, work. Yep. 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 Um, okay, real quickly, I just want to throw the yeah. I found the Mahomes numbers. Uh, the last seven times that Kelsey's hit for a score you would want, Mahomes has put up 30, 24, 38, 35, 39, 28, 36. Pretty incredible wow. as when yeah. Kelsey hits. Um, okay, so we want to probably move off of the Pickens and Evans one. Um, mm-hmm. and what we could do is we could see what happens if we go down to well let's let's look at these wide receivers and see let's let's assume that we're going to stick with Eno Benjamin we're doing enough different elsewhere uh yeah. 7 and 7 and 4.6k doesn't quite get it done but let's see who we've got here in this um like 6k range Amari Cooper is actually really interesting as a bring back on a on a Ramondre yeah Oscar, a guy who is again double digit targets man coverage he's going to be involved they don't need Brissett to be throwing a ton of passes for him to get those looks. So we could go Amari and then 5,300 actually gives us some really interesting pricing to play around with as well, where we've got, uh, yeah, we could end up going with, um, if you scroll down a little bit, we've got Elijah Moore who could actually, I mean, has some ceiling, not a guy that we're going out of our way to play this week. Um, I think he's 4,900 this week. Or we could go down at defense and kind of freeze some things up. We also can keep in mind that this is not our not our main build this week, but it's just more getting a sense of how this slate fits together and um, how we would approach this build in terms of differentiating from the field. Um, I know you liked uh, Pickens as the um, Pickens appeal only as a mini with a buck, or would you maybe consider? No, not Pickens at all. Yeah, I mean, and- I think we can we can comfortably say the Bucks are going to have a good game here, right? But that can mm-hmm. still be spread out to where you don't need Mike Evans and they put up. What we really want is the Bucks to take a lead and then play a little bit softer defense and Pickens hit some big plays. And so uh, we can throw Pickens in here and then we can throw that extra salary onto our defense or onto our running back. Right, exactly. That would give us 700. I'm not going to be able to get up to Nick Chubb and we already did Amari. Um, it seems like it might be better spent at, at, at defense getting up to one of these that uh, that you liked here. Yeah, I guess we can go, I mean, Minnesota on the road against Skyler. We were still in a little bit of a weird range with salary, but no reason to like spend from Eno to somebody else because it's not necessarily an upgrade. So we can look to basically change up Amari or change up our defense. Um, You know, and if we wanted to, uh, I don't know who's up there at 6,900 at wide receiver. Yeah, nobody would really want to go to. Um, T. Higgins, obviously interesting if he ends up playing. Waddle is interesting at low ownership, but um, yeah, I'm totally fine going up to, or even like taking a 3,100 defense and, um, Bengals against, uh, against Jameis or Andy Dalton are interesting. They've actually played really yeah. well on defense this year, but yeah, we're kind of in this weird salary range, but we have a roster generally, broadly speaking that we really like. And last week I had a lot of rosters where I was 100 off on fitting in Jefferson and Gabe Davis. And I kept pushing things around and ended up not pulling the trigger because it would have forced me to go from who was the running? Oh, Brees Hall was 5,400. It would have forced me to go from Jeff Wilson down to Brees Hall. And I didn't mm-hmm. want to pull the trigger on that. And so obviously that in retrospect, that would have been a great move. And so on these rosters where you're kind of 100 off, there's all there's always smart to be like, hey, is there a place where I can 
actually take on a little bit of extra risk, but not lower my ceiling at all by saving 100 at one of these other spots. So if we had infinite time and we had that Mike Evans pickens sort of setup that we were looking at earlier, I would push around in a lot of different places. But we're also pretty specific on how we're building this roster so far. And so, uh, yeah, I like the way that we've ended up here and really like kind of the starting point and I like the differentiation. We just say we'll play the chalk running backs, but Isaiah McKenzie low owned, Mahomes Kelsey low owned combo. Great way to get uh, exposure to that game. Duvernay plays off the fact that we're playing Mahomes and Kelsey. We've got a low owned Amari Cooper. We've got a low owned George Pickens. Can all these guys score 30 plus points? Yes, 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 across the board. Uh, and so we feel really good about this roster, putting it into a tournament in terms of the ceiling that we have and not just the ceiling, but our paths to first place if these guys are hidden. Yeah. And, you know, on, on first glance, if you showed me this lineup, the, uh, the, the alpha wide receiver lover and me would be like, man, it, it sure would be nice to have a cup, a Jefferson, a chase. But when you think through the specific leverage angles that you're talking about and how the popular place fails and how these guys could be the beneficiaries of it, I think it really, really starts to make a ton of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely tournament roster where you're saying, uh, are you going to hit that clumped up middle most of the time? No, but if that clumped up middle kind of misses, can you jump over it? Yes. Even if that clumped up middle kind of hits, can you jump over it? Yes. And so this gives us a clear path to first place, which we always want. Yep. Um, well, as usual, um, this is meant to be a thought exercise. It's meant to see how to logically build a lineup around one of JM's favorite blocks. This one being the Mahomes, Kelsey, and Devin Duvernay. H how many blocks do you think you're going to have up for the people on the scroll this week? I had four set, and then I, uh, I came up with another one when I was recording the Angles podcast. So I think we'll have five this week uh, up, on the, uh, up in the player grid in the scroll. There you go. Uh, you guys can, of course, get access to that over on one week season. You can get a 20% off with the with the weekly pass if you want to try that with promo code P, or you can take advantage of this 40% off week for the OWS DFS and the Inner Circle. I highly recommend it. Includes all of the podcasts as well, which are great listen throughout the week. JM, uh, it was great to have you back. The people were clamoring for it. Any, uh, any final words here on, on your end before we uh, get out of here? No favorite, favorite hour of my weeks. Fun to be back. Fun to be, uh, I'm safe. Just don't worry about this backdrop. <laughs> don't, you guys, don't be concerned. Uh, and yeah, I'll be back home next week. So, uh, looking forward to being on here again, hanging out. Awesome. And I also recommend, uh, appreciate all you guys who are YouTube members. If you are part of the hand builders and opto bros tier, you get access to that private discord within the deposit kingdom discord that also gets you access to my Sunday morning crams that I do at 10 30, walking through all the final news notes, ownership projections for the upcoming slate and, uh, all kinds of good conversation in there. The, the cheat I posted earlier showing kind of that ceiling optimal. We bat those around all week, give you guys ideas of the chalk build, lots of good conversations in there. So I highly recommend that as well. Appreciate you guys hanging out. Good luck with your builds. Good luck with your building blocks, Jan. And I will see you at the top of the leaderboards. Peace.